When I was younger, my family and I would often go up to the cabin. The cabin is owned by my father's friend who allows us to stay free of charge. The cabin is a part of a small line of about 10 other cabins with a gravel road dividing them. It's a cute little area we still visit to this day. We usually stay a week, but one time I went ice fishing with my father when I was about eight or nine. We go up in the winter and in the summer. We weren't planning on staying there for the night, but by the time we were done ice fishing, we were cold and he didn't feel like driving. There's three bedrooms in total. The one I stayed in that night had a bunk bed. I slept on the top and my dad slept on the bottom. I was on my DS fairly late. I wasn't really tired. It was probably around 1 or 2 a.m. But out of nowhere, all sounds completely cut out for me and all I heard was the name Jackie. Weirdly, I wasn't freaked out by this. It's like I'd gone deaf for a few seconds and just heard this name and then everything was back to normal. I decided to call it a night and went to bed. I told my dad a few years later what had happened. The lake next to our cabin was originally a town that was flooded by the government when they constructed a dam back in the late 20s, I believe. What I didn't know is that there was also a large cemetery that was a part of the town. My parents believe this might be an answer to what I experienced that night. When we go to the cabin now, I don't usually see or hear anything besides feeling really uncomfortable when I'm alone. I feel like something really likes me there, if that makes sense. It's not scary, it's just weird. I was around 10 years old when I had my first interaction with something that I couldn't explain. And it happened in broad daylight. The whole incident started out like every other weekend. The neighbourhood kids all got together to play what we called Ghost in the Graveyard, which is typically supposed to be played at night. But my sister and I could never stay out past dusk due to our curfew. We played a few rounds before I was the tagger, everyone scattering within the set boundaries. Now, we have a long stretch of woods between our townhomes and the highway. The width gradually thinning when someone walked from the line of the townhouses that I lived in to the line on the far end of the property. I was travelling parallel to this forest. The particular section I was following was behind a line of townhouses and bathed in shadow. I kept my eye out for anyone who may be hiding, so I wasn't exactly caught off guard when I suddenly heard the crunch of foliage as someone ran through the forest a few feet away from the sidewalk that I was walking on. My head whipped to the side just in time to see a girl around my age with long brown hair and a yellow shirt dart by me in the woods. I gave chase, thinking it was someone from our group. But before I got even halfway across the line of townhouses, she was suddenly gone, having vanished into thin air. I thought it was weird, but brushed it off and continued playing until everyone had made it out to the safe zone. I remember looking over the other kids and suddenly realising that no one matched the description of the girl I saw. It couldn't have been anyone new, because no one had moved in lately, and the only person who could possibly match the mystery girl's description was my sister and I. But neither of us were in the woods at the time of or wearing yellow, or even owned a yellow shirt for that matter. Most of the paranormal interactions I had that I can remember are from when I was in high school, and this incident was no different. My sister and I invited a group of her friends over for a Nerf war, since we owned a sizable amount of Nerf guns of all shapes and sizes. Now, our house was known to be a hotspot for the strange and unexplained, so we had code words set up for if something of the paranormal nature might happen. We always started off with making sure the house was as dark as we could get it, were actually playing during the day. By closing the curtains and covering windows with thick blankets. My sister's team were the first seekers, my group scattering to hide. I went upstairs and ducked into the bathroom. Now, the layout consists of two rooms. The first room was where the sink was, a huge mirror spanning across the entirety of the wall above the sink. The second room was further in. That's where the toilet and bathtub was. I stayed in the first room, looking for a place to hide, 
when I noticed movement behind me in the mirror. I knew for a fact that I was the only one in the bathroom because I was the first one up the stairs. Against my better judgment, I used a reflection to look at the figure. The dark shape was tucked between the open door to the other half of the bathroom in a cabinet, so tall that its head was level with the door frame. It had no features, just a solid black shape that imitated the shape of a person. Even though it didn't have eyes, I knew that it was looking back at me. Next thing I know, I'm tearing out of the bathroom and taking the stairs two at a time, while shouting our code word for an instance like this. Curtains were opened, letting light flood in, and we all gathered in the living room so I could recount my experience. We mutually agreed to stop playing and go outside for a while, so we cleaned up and made ourselves scarce. The setting was a three-story apartment that me, my sister, let's call her Chris, and Nana moved into after we left our mother's house. It was pretty late, around midnight, and I was the only one awake and was reading on my phone and waiting to get tired. Chris and I shared a room while our Nana had the second, which wasn't a problem because it wasn't like we hadn't done so before. So for context, the layout of the apartment from our room was Chris's bed was against the left wall. Then there was a nightstand that was between her bed and mine, my bed being closest to the bathroom. Now, we only had a blue lava lamp on the bookshelf between the bathroom and my bed as a nightlight, seeing as neither of us were very fond of the dark. The bathroom had two doors, one that was connected to our room and the other led to the entrance hall, which was where the front door was. The entrance hall opened up into the dining room, which had the kitchen in front of it and the living room to the right. I was laying on my back and staring at my phone when I noticed something odd. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see a flickering blue light, like a candle. I could see it from the open bathroom door. Since we had left both doors open that night, and it seemed to be coming from the entryway or dining room. I ignored it at first, because while Chris might investigate, I tended to ignore paranormal happenings, racking my brain for anything that might possibly be producing the weird light but there was nothing. There was no rational excuse for the blue light. When I dropped my phone flat against my chest to plunge the room into relative darkness and looked directly into the bathroom, the light was still there. I laid there for a moment, debating what to do before ultimately throwing my covers back and climbing out of bed. I warily padded into the bathroom, stopping at the threshold of the second floor. Goosebumps rose on my arms when I saw that there was no light source, the rest of the house pitch black. Confused and rattled, I stepped out into the entryway and I shit you not, as soon as I left the bathroom, Chris woke up screaming. I don't think I've ever flinched so hard in my life. I rushed back into the room and flipped the switch for the bathroom. Chris was clearly disoriented, confused as to why she was even awake. I asked her what she saw, and although Chris said that she didn't remember, the timing was too perfect for it to just have been a coincidence. Fortunately, that was the only strange experience I had in that particular apartment. For as long as I can remember, I've had dreams right before someone passes. Most of the time it's been family members, but sometimes it's been people I don't know. I'd first like to point out that my family is familiar with deaths. I say this because we have a large family and are pretty close with each other. My husband and I were discussing death and why we were so uncomfortable with it, and he shared he had only had about five people he was close to pass, where I had had 33 that my mother, father, and myself could think of. I would have had rather vague dreams about the death but most of the time, due to the circumstances, I could decipher who it was. The two that stand out most are my grandfather's passing and my mother's cousin. My mother's father was a very hard-working brick mason and would never show weakness. When he was a child, he and his brother had to have blood transfusions and both of them unfortunately got leukemia. My grandfather's brother chose to do chemotherapy and passed when I was two. 
my grandfather chose to take chemo pills and lived until I was 10. Like I said earlier, my grandfather was a brick mason and a very hard worker. He worked up until a week before his death, and we all knew when he stopped working that the cancer had got the better of him. For that last week, my mother and her sisters called in hospice nurses, which are end-of-life nurses, essentially. The night that everyone was sure it would be his last, my mother and father called my father's aunt and uncle to take us to their house for the night. My entire life, I remember going to kiss my grandfather and tell him goodbye. I remember my great aunt and uncle being there to take us to their house for the night, but I never remember going to their house or waking up to go to school the next day. But I remember the dream I had, like I was present in the room as my grandfather passed. In the dream, I was standing at his bedroom door, watching his breathing slow, watching his daughters come in and out of the room, and eventually all of them gathering together as he took his last breath. I'd also like to point out that my mother knew about my dreams and came to accept them. The day after his death, I remember my mother and father coming to the school to pick my sisters and I up. I still see her walking down the hall to meet us with absolute sadness on her face. I was the oldest and my sisters were still pretty young. So she looked down at me and said, Papa had passed. I was confused in my little 10 year old mind why she was telling me this when I really thought I was there. I told her, I know mom, I was there. She told me I wasn't there, but asked why I believed I was. So on the way home, I told her about my dream and I could see my parents exchanging glances in the front seat. Later in life, she told me my dream was accurate with the events that went on that night. But how do you deal with a child that has these dreams? The next dream happened when I was a little older. I would say I was about 15 or 16. At the time, my mother's uncle was diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer. He was a very sweet man who was religious and loved to play the guitar. The one thing that stood out to me about him was his fingernails, which I thought were pretty long. The family knew he was pretty sick and his passing would be soon. I went to bed like normal with no discussion of his looming passing and hadn't thought about it really. In this dream, I could see a casket. I could see an arm and my eyes slowly went down the arm to see long fingernails. But I could also see flames behind the casket. I woke up distraught. All I could think about was this very religious, very kind-hearted, loving man going to hell. If he went to hell, then I wasn't making it to heaven. I jumped up out of my bed to talk to my mother about my dream. I flung the door open and she was already on the phone. She was upset and I thought I knew the news she was receiving. After she hung up the phone, before she could say anything, I asked. It was uncle, wasn't it? She said no, it was and then cousin's name. Apparently, her cousin and her husband had gone to bed, and sometime during the night, her house had caught on fire, and they had both passed. Everything in my dream came rushing back to me, and it's all made now. The very feminine nails, the flames, all of it. I told my mother about the dream, and how I thought her uncle had gone to hell. I was bothered by the death of her cousin, but I was still relieved that I didn't dream of someone going to hell. In 2013, I believe it was Thanksgiving Day, my sister and I found out we were both pregnant. We were both very excited to be pregnant together. We're the closest out of the four of us siblings and thought it would be great to share this experience. I had already had two children and she had one, so the plan was to go to each other's doctor's appointments and have a baby shower together. January was my first ultrasound and she wasn't gonna miss that. So we went to the appointment and she sat next to me excited to see her new niece or nephew. The ultrasound technician came in and began. Like I said, I had two children and my sister had one already. So looking at the screen, you could see my child. But something wasn't right. I couldn't hear anything and thought the tech might have the volume down. And I stared at the screen, but no movement. I looked at my sister and I could tell she had the same concerns. The tech was nervous by this point and kept moving the wand around saying something but I couldn't tell you what until she said, let me go get the doctor. We both knew why. 
We sat there in silence until they both returned and the doctor came. Mum, your baby has no heartbeat and has passed. I want to add that my sister is a very soft-hearted person and I knew the loss of my child crushed her. I, on the other hand, am not bothered by death as badly. Yes, this was my unborn child, but I have thicker skin when it comes to this and at the time I was okay. Fast forward to the beginning of February. I was scheduled for a DNC. This is a surgery where the doctors remove the fetus. I didn't want my sister to go to this because this was not a happy time. My mother told me she'd go with me. We're also very close, so that was great. The day of the surgery, however, my mother woke up with the flu and was sick. My dad reluctantly stepped in, not because he didn't love me, but because this was awkward for him. I remember laying on the bed before the surgery, my dad next to me in the chair and we were watching the news. They were calling for snow, which didn't happen often in the city we were in. Then the nurses came to wheel me to surgery. In this part of the hospital, all the patients were in rooms against the back wall, with all glass fronts and curtains for privacy. At the end of the hall were a set of double doors. You went right and then immediately left into another set of double doors to the surgery suite. I remember climbing onto the surgery table myself, because I'm very stubborn. The last thing I remember is the anesthesiologist talking to me and then telling me to count back from 10. I remember getting to 9. The next thing I knew, I woke up in recovery, feeling like I'd been hit by a truck. My throat hurt and my body ached. I would also like to point out that my dad's side of the family doesn't do well with an anesthesia. The doctor came to see me and said they put a tube in my throat because I stopped breathing. But everything else was fine. So a couple hours later, I was released. I just wanted to go to bed. We had just gotten out of the hospital driveway into the first stoplight and it began to snow. We had a 30 minute drive and had plenty of time for small talk and enjoying the snow. We arrived at home and I asked my mother if she would watch my children so I could take a nap. By this time she was feeling better and happy to do so. Now, here's where my ghost story came to play. As I said before, I wasn't emotionally torn up by my loss or very religious at this point in my life. I crawled into my bed and went to sleep. Then I started dreaming. In the dream, I was back in that pre-surgery room with my gown on and those fuzzy socks they give you. But now I was alone in the room and standing at the door, looking down the hall. I could see myself, or well, the back of me, walking down the hall to the double doors. And with me, holding my hand, was a little boy about one year old. Curly blonde hair, jeans on, but I could see his little diaper sticking out. A long-sleeved burgundy shirt, holding a sippy cup in the other arm. We got to the double doors, and now I was me holding my child's hand. The doors opened and all I saw was an extremely bright light and heard a voice saying, I'll take it from here. I woke up ruined emotionally. I was crying and heartbroken, but happy all at once. My mother came to see what was wrong because she said I hadn't been asleep that long and thought that I was in pain from the surgery. I told her about the dream and she hugged me and started to cry with me. I know I got the chance to see my child. Now every year on Mother's Day, no matter how cold, a tiny blue butterfly always finds me. I know some people will say I'm looking for it, but I know it's my son coming to visit me. It always gets super close to me and stays for a bit and then flies off. It gives me such peace. Last thing I'd like to add, after I had my surgery, my sister went to the doctor and her baby passed well. I felt guilty because I feel like she was so upset about my loss that it caused hers. A while back, I acknowledged what may have been a lapse in judgement on my part. I moved out of my house, where I was experiencing a number of strange occurrences. I moved out because I'd gotten a better job, and I'm attending college part-time. So I had nothing to actually do with the house itself but I'm fearful that whatever it was may have followed me to my new place. I moved into a two bedroom, maybe a, an hour and a half away from where I was living before. I've been here for a little over a month now. 
about a week ago, I started taking notice of a few things that just didn't seem right to me. The first thing that happened was this aggressive tapping outside my window. It sounded kind of like somebody's fingernail hitting my window from the outside. I live on the second floor, so I don't know how this would be possible. If I had to make an educated guess, I'd say that maybe there could be an explanation for that. But it's a little creepy regardless. Because it will do it, then I'll check it out. Then as soon as I'm sitting back down, it will happen again. The second thing that happened that I can't explain is the door to my bedroom slammed shut as I was leaving. The door wasn't even remotely closed when this happened. I don't exactly know how to write about fear, but it scared the hell out of me. So much so that I needed to go to the gym just to get my nerves out. The last thing, which happened last night, was when I opened my closet door. The closet came with a mirror inside of it, which I already don't like. When I opened it to get my bag, I could see my reflection, but also the dark silhouette of a figure standing next to me. I'm 6'1", and whatever was standing near me was roughly a little taller than my elbow. I turned around, but of course didn't see anything. I will say that this was not my imagination, as I had seen it for a couple of seconds. This scared me completely, like I could feel my knees getting weak and my heart rate rising. I'm normally pretty sceptical, as I'm sure a lot of you will be. That's completely fine. If there's an explanation about this that anybody knows about, I would love to hear it. If anybody has any suggestions on how to proceed from here, I'd love to hear about that as well. During a school break, me and my mum and one of my older brothers went to visit our uncle on his ranch in Nevada. I have trouble sleeping, so one night I decided to take a walk around the perimeter of the ranch, just for some air. I had made it all the way to the other side of the ranch, to the far end of the pastures. From the last fence to a woodsy hill area is about 50 yards. I decided to stay and look up in the grassy area to look at the stars. What no one had told this city girl was that there were no trees and no lights, save for the barn on the other side of the ranch. You can see so many fucking stars. It was breathtaking to see the universe like that. I started whistling. I heard a branch crack, so I stopped, a little startled. Then something else started to whistle right at me. I froze, and it seemed like every hair on my body stood straight up. I couldn't move, and the whistling got louder and closer. It was the almost exact same nonsense melody I was whistling not 15 seconds ago. I know what you're thinking. Birds are a thing. Bull fucking shit. I know the difference between a bird and whatever the hell that was. And this ain't even over yet, so buckle up. I, the stupid white girl in a horror movie, decided to say, uh, hello? Something said, uh, hello? Right back to me, in my own voice. And yes, I know what my voice sounds like. Slightly raspy, faint Bronx accent, usually lower pitched unless I'm excited or mad. Then it's usually so high pitched my friends say I sound like Harley Quinn on Adderall. Another branch snapped and that was my cue to fucking bucket back down around the paddocks, back to the barn and main house, which was about two acres. It was like a blur. I have knee issues from a car crash, but I didn't even feel an ache as I sprinted all the way back to the main house. I still don't know what it was. Didn't tell anyone else about it, despite my mom being extremely superstitious. I did a bit of frantic googling the day after, and the closest thing I could come up with was a skinwalker. Can anyone help? I'm still freaked. And it happened in February of this year. Any suggestions as to what the fuck that was are welcome. I work in a basement at a bank. I have several co-workers. I love my job. Everyone gets along great. The basement is well lit, cheerful, tastefully decorated, recently renovated, and we have very comfortable catered conditions. We have fun conversations throughout the day. Nothing creepy except for the old vault, i.e. an underground tunnel which used to connect to the bank across the street, but it's been sealed off in the middle. So now it's just a creepy underground tunnel in the electrical closet. But I don't feel it's malicious. It's just that dark, unknown tunnels are just naturally creepy. 
A couple years ago, before the basement was renovated, a few loan officers were still working in their offices in the basements after 5.30. A normal occurrence. On one end of the basement was one of those big plastic trash bins on a rolling cart, and suddenly, the trash can on the rolling cart made its way across the basement floor before rolling to a stop in the now call centre. The room went silent, and everyone quickly left together unnerved. Being a bank, cameras record inside 24-7. They kept the footage of the basement from 5.45 to 6.15 and saved it to our internal server. Nothing extraordinary happened in the footage. A few bugs with discernible bodies and wings flying in and out of frame in an erratic pattern. Then there are orbs. There's literally nothing else I can call them. They are clearly round circles that move smoothly occasionally disappearing, but reappearing exactly in the path you'd expect them to be moving in. We've been down in the basement for about seven months now, since the remodel slash renovation was complete. There's nothing to report, save for an extremely small and minor but recurring occurrence. Our call centre is made of cubicles that you cannot see over it unless standing. My co-workers and I have all been alone in the call centre at one point, and each of us have experienced the sound of someone sitting idly at a desk across from yours. Not discernible typing, but the sound when someone just kind of rests their fingertips on the keyboard when they're thinking of what they're going to type. Brief moments of the mouse on the desk, and general desk shuffling like brushing aside pens and paper. To the point that each of us at one point asked aloud, Oh hey, I didn't realise you were back from lunch already. Only to be met with silence, because a co-worker is still at lunch. One of the officers in the basement needed some kind of work done to it. So they moved the manager who works in the office across the basement to another office temporarily. He's already back to his old office, but we wonder if something about the office being occupied has some kind of effect on the energy. The manager from that office could see the Christmas tree in the middle of the basement. One day, just a week ago, movement caught his attention and he watched two ornaments on different sides of the tree fall roll and meet each other again in front of the tree. And note that these were his personal ornaments he brought from home to decorate with the tree with. He took them home today. The manager would frequently yell out, Hey John, come over here, across the basement, when he was in his original office. Now, all he had to do was speak in an inside voice, since he had temporarily moved into the office next door to the employee, and had several times summoning him to pass on a report that needed to be done or remember that needed to be called. On the last day of being in that temporary office, John heard his boss say from the office next door, Hey John, come over here. He went up to the office to ask the boss what was needed, only for the boss to tell him he never summoned him. John swears that he heard clear as day in his boss's voice. That was last week. Today, as my co-worker Kayla ends her call, Another co-worker, Tiffany, says, Hey, why did you say my name on that call? What's up? Thinking she had previously spoken to the member. Kayla tells Tiffany that she never mentioned her name. Tiffany states that she heard Kayla clear as day say her name. The energy that resides in the basement is always described as friendly and harmless. And I agree. Even with my involuntary shielding ability, it seems to bear no ill will. But the mimicking is new and honestly kind of gives me the creeps. Is every mimic definitely malicious? And should we attempt to release it and free ourselves from it? Ignore it? Could this be a peaceful energy that simply enjoys mimicking? Or that's all it knows how to do? Back in January, I had a very detailed dream. In this dream, I was burying a body under the patio in the garden. The garden didn't look like mine, and it wasn't one that I recall ever seeing. While I was burying the body, a man who I had never seen before was standing in front of me, watching me the entire time. He didn't say anything. He just stared at me. I remember how scared I felt, knowing I needed to keep this body a secret. I woke up the next morning, remembering every detail, but it was just a weird dream, so I brushed it off. Things started to get a little strange in my house from that day. My dog started to become more reactive, 
barking and physically scared of something that I couldn't see on my landing. I'd woken up a few times in the night and could have sworn I'd seen a figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. This wasn't even the worst part. The day after I first started seeing the figure in the doorway, I was changing my bed sheets. I threw back the duvet to find spots of dried blood on my sheets. I thought that maybe I'd scratched myself in my sleep. However, I couldn't find any evidence of this. I changed my bed sheets and thought nothing of it. The next day, while making my bed, the blood was there again. This has continued every day. I couldn't find the source of the blood and it was starting to drive me mad. This figure had become more frequent, almost nightly at this point. I started to speak to it, asking it questions. Maybe it needed help. Never would I get an answer. I was thinking about seeing a medium or getting the house blessed because at this point it was driving me insane. That was until last week. For the first time in months, no figure, no blood, no barking dogs. Everything just stopped. The following day, I was scrolling through social media and came across a photo of a man that was attached to an article. I hadn't even looked at the article title, I was fixated on this picture. As soon as I saw his face, I knew it was the man from my dream. I clicked straight on the article to find out that this man's body had been recently recovered from underneath a woman's patio. It turns out she had stabbed him in the neck, wrapped him in a bedsheet and buried him under her garden patio back in November. I have no idea if this is just a weird coincidence or if he's been trying to tell me for months what's happened to him. Throughout my life, I've grown up with six cats and two dogs. The cats passed away slowly over my childhood. The cats we had were Zoe, Tigger, Sheba, Patches, TJ and Jack, from oldest to youngest. Now, Jack passed away as a kitten. Sheba, the mom, wouldn't feed him. And one time, when he had gone out for a couple of hours, he had climbed out of his basket, and my mom found him freezing. Despite a ton of effort, he couldn't be saved. Little nine-year-old me was super sad. I cried, and I named him after his passing. The next cat to pass was Tigger. He was a fat cat and hoovered his food. I hadn't seen him much over the course of a day, and when I went to feed him that night, I found him unable to stand up on his hind legs. Mom and Dad grabbed him, nursed him for a couple hours, and when he woke up the next day, prepping to take him to the vet, he was already gone. Vet suspected he had a heart attack. We picked up his ashes on my 10th birthday. A few months after he had passed, I woke up in the middle of the night. I had no idea why, but when I looked down, I saw a cat-shaped cloud curled up between my legs. When he was alive still, he and Sheba would curl up there together. Over the years, each cat slowly died. Patches, 2006. TJ in 2011. Sheba a few months later, also in 2011. Then, we lost our grumpy girl Zoe in the beginning of 2012. And that's when I really got to experience the ghost of a cat. Zoe was a climber in life. You'd hear movement on a high up shelf and then things would start shooting off and hit the floor. She had a bad habit of trying to eat the dog's food. My dad came out one morning and saw a full on apparition of her sitting in front of the dog bowl, which she knew she wasn't to do, as evidenced by the fact that she immediately ran away and disappeared. Earn day, you know you're not supposed to be in the dog's food, you little shit, from my dad. She was also very much a window cat. You'd always see her tail twitching out from under the window coverings, which my mom saw on many occasions after Zoe had passed. And finally, my experience. We had a wood-burning stove in this house. Just off to the side of it was the dining table. I was sitting in front of them, but still partly between them. Right behind me, I heard Zoe's little, I want attention, chitter. Something I never really heard from her when she was alive, as she was my mom's cat. And only my mom was worthy of that chitter. Even though they've all been gone for at least a decade, I still miss them very much. And I do wish I could see them all again. Unfortunately, we no longer live in either of the homes where the activities happened.
So when I was in high school, I had something happen as I slept. Over the years, I tried to justify it away. I was just asleep, even if I didn't realize it. My arm fell asleep, that's what happened. If people can strangle themselves with their own hand that fell asleep, then I could have done this. Only problem with these justifications is that I was wide awake at the time and still to this day vividly remember it. Trying to justify it helps me, but doesn't change what happened. It was at night. One of those nights where you toss and turn but can't fall asleep. Not for like a trying. And not even a tired but can't sleep state. Just wide awake but knowing you should be sleeping. I had just rolled over to check the time and saw it was around 3am. I roll back over to my back and throw my arms out in exasperation. Only my right arm, the side facing the inside wall of the bed inside of the open side, hit something cold and hard. I immediately pull it back, sit up slightly to try and get a better look and tentatively reach back out. The second I touch that cold hard thing again, it's just a flurry of movement. Like I woke something up and can feel the rush of air. Next thing I know, I'm being dragged back to the headboard by my hair. Something is gripping it and trying to pull me down between the bars of my headboard. I'm fighting for my life, but also can't get a sound out. I'm trying to scream, but only parts escape. I'm trying to pull my hair and head free, but can't get a grasp of the narrow space between my headboard and wall. I finally did get free, but it wasn't from anything I did. I had black spots in my vision at that point from lack of oxygen and still couldn't get in a full breath. I sat in the middle of my bed just circling 360 degrees for about 10 minutes, searching for threats as I tried to get my breath back. Eventually, I calmed down. This was still in my dumb teenage phase with no sense of self-preservation, so I tried calling out for whatever was there. I even stuck my arm down the headboard to see if I could feel anything. Nothing. I then got up and turned on the light. Grabbed a flashlight to check under the bed too. It was empty, except for a clump of my hair that was underneath the headboard by the wall. Didn't get any sleep that night. Never had it happen again. What might that have been? Was it just my arm falling asleep and attacking me? Was it something else? And has anyone had anything like this happen? been bugging me for a while, just wondering if I'm the only one to go through something like this. The first bit of this will be my experience watching The Ring. The second bit will be my brother's experience watching it. I don't know if just watching a movie can bring about stuff like this, but both of us saw it at our respective friends' houses and neither of those friends have had any issues with stuff like this before or since. So for me, I watched the movie with my friends. We were in their bedroom with all parents and siblings out of the house for a few hours. It was just the three of us, and we started the movie with the bedroom door shut, and the closet door opened just a bit, with the lights on inside so it wasn't completely dark. We were totally engrossed in the movie, About halfway through, one of my friends asked us to pause it for a bit because they were freaking out. So we did, only to realize that the light we left on was now off, so it was completely dark. We did the whole, you get up to turn the light on. No, you get up. No, you get up. Until I decided to bite the bullet and just go turn the light on. I hopped off the bed we had all crowded onto in order to watch the movie, and I immediately landed in a puddle of freezing cold water. I instantly sprint to the light switch by the door and turn it on. The closet door we had left open was now closed. The room door that had been closed was now open. The closet light was off and there was a puddle of water left on each side of the bed. No one besides us was home at the time and we didn't bring any drinks to the room. So there's no way someone could have just spilled water. We never finished the movie that night and I haven't seen it since. About 10 years later, I had come home after being in the Marines. At that time, my younger brother had taken my room, so I used his. Had some other weird stuff happen that I can get into another time. And I was telling my brother about it, only to find out he'd had the same stuff happen to him for years, sleeping in that room. This led us to telling each other a bunch of other spooky stuff that had happened to us. And so I told him the story about the time I saw the ring. 
It was the first time I'd told him about it, and he gave a story of his own that happened a few years after me, when he saw it for the first time too. He was with his friends and their parents. They were all crowded into the living room watching it. About halfway through, around the same part I had stopped watching the movie, they heard heavy footsteps and then a door slam in the hallway behind them. Like a loud slam. And the dogs there didn't even bark or growl. They were just cowering away from the hallway. That hallway was one that could only be accessed through the room they were all in watching the movie. No way for an intruder to get in any other way, unless they broke a window. While all the windows in the bedrooms in that hallway were locked and intact. I even confirmed it later on with the adults who were present at that time, just in case it was my brother over-imagining things. It really did happen like that. They didn't find anyone in that hallway, had no way to explain what they heard, and also never finished the movie. Not sure at all what this might have been, but I still haven't seen the rest of the movie since. I'm curious to try it again someday, and see if something happens again. But I don't really want to tempt fate. When I was 18, I worked in a care home for just over two years. It was a home for adults with learning disabilities, and there were around 30 residents living there. The building was L-shaped, with four units all connected to one another. You needed a key fob to enter the building and go through to the other units. Across from the units was another building with the offices, meds room, an activity room and two flats upstairs where two residents lived. The laundry room was attached to this building but like an extension and you had to go outside to go in there. In the mornings I'd be doing laundry in the laundry room and I'd heard whistling in the room and I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. That could have been someone outside so I would brush it off. This happened all the time. Another time I was in the laundry room. I had my back to the door folding clothes. I heard someone walk in and say hello. I replied hello. Whoever it was said hello again. When I turned around and said hi again thinking they didn't hear me the first time, there was no one there. We used to mess around on nights filming the corridor in the dark and orbs would fly everywhere and we got a few pictures of faces and stuff which is just crazy. I really wish I had them now but my friend changed her Facebook and they were all saved in the messages. One of the girls got a video of the door opening slightly by itself and these were heavy fire doors. She screenshot the video when the door opens and you can see a person through the glass. One night I was working with two other girls. We were sitting in the lounge on a break between checks of one of the units watching TV and eating snacks. It was around 3 or 4am and we heard three loud bangs on the glass of the door from outside. We all jumped up and absolutely crapped ourselves. We went to every door in every bedroom. No one was awake and no one was outside. We didn't leave each other the entire night. It really shocked us. One of the residents would talk to someone in her room. She couldn't walk or talk in sentences. She would say words and laugh at around 2am and other residents mentioned seeing people in their bedrooms. On nights there was not one person who hadn't seen something like a shadow or figure. The place was maybe 10 or 15 years old and a lot of people died there, so it's not surprising. My nana and my stepdad told me a lot of stories when I was a teenager about Nana's house. My stepdad is a non-believer of everything, the paranormal, afterlife, religion, etc. So when he told me these stories, I really believed him. He had never been a liar or exaggerated. My Nana lived in a back-to-back -back terraced housing in the outskirts of Wakefield. I don't really know how long she's been there for. She told me about a spirit she has in her house named Ned. Some small things happened in the beginning, stuff moving around and whatnot. Gordy, my step-grandad, also an unbeliever, seemed to be his main target. He said he'd be walking down the stairs, osh basket at the top of the stairs, and a sock would hit, it, hit him in the back of the head. Or one day, the wash basket knocked over behind him. He would put his towel on the rack in the bathroom, and when he got out the shower, it would be on the floor on the other side of the bathroom. 
My nana was sitting in the living room one day watching TV and she turned to the side and a figure stood next to her. He was wearing a striped shirt with large cuffs on the wrists and my nana ran up to the garden screaming to Gordy. She said she was too scared to look up at his face in case it was horrible looking or something. Another was that when my stepbrother's mum was pregnant with him, she was sitting on the sofa and the leg of her PJ started slowly raising up her leg. My nana shouted, Ned, stop, and her PJ leg dropped back down. My uncle also had an experience. He was on leave from the army and had a friend staying with him at my nana's. He let his friend sleep upstairs and he slept in the living room. In the middle of the night, he woke up to the dog flying open and the dog's two tiny Jack Russells came charging into the room looking unsettled. My uncle then saw a figure run from the back door into where the pantry is. He was so scared that he slept on the floor upstairs next to his friend. When I used to stay over, I would share a room with my stepbrother. He was a few years younger than me. He used to be terrified of Ned and some nights we'd get some really weird feelings. We'd wake up hearing someone walking about our room or on the landing. My stepdad didn't say much about his own experiences in that house, but he did tell me that he came from base one weekend and saw his neighbour across the road pull in on his motorbike at his usual home time from work. He waved at him and said hello. He said hello back. My stepdad went inside and my nana asked who he's talking to. When he told her a neighbour, my nana seemed shocked. The guy had died in a motorbike accident that week and my stepdad didn't know because he was posted a few hours away. When I was around 13, my mum, older brother and I moved into a three-storey new-build house. It was on a newly built housing estate and only about five years old. I had two friends over in the middle of the day watching films and we decided to play a game. Me and one friend were standing on the top floor of the house in the bathroom, which was directly at the top of the stairs. And my other friend was standing at the bottom of the stairs. We were laughing and joking and suddenly, what looked like a black sheet covered the bathroom door, then seemed to disappear into my mum's bedroom. Me and my friend in the bathroom both looked at each other in disbelief, and my friend at the bottom of the stairs saw it too. She was standing on the stairs in disbelief too. I used to help my mum a lot with the housework. She was a single parent and worked a lot. I thought I would hoover up the stairs before she got home. Must have been around 5pm. As I was hoovering the stairs, I saw a black figure at the bottom of the stairs looking at me. When I stood up straight to turn around, he ran into the wall and seemed to fade into the wall, which was connected to the garage. Nearly every night, I would wake up at random times to use the toilet, and he would be there, just stood in my bedroom. The thing is, though, he never scared me. I didn't feel frightened or uneasy when he was around. I feel like he may have been looking out for me. But you never know. Me and my friends gave him the name Simon, a name that popped into my head after seeing him a couple of times. Other little things would happen, like things moving around the house when I swore I put them somewhere else. Or I would hear someone on the stairs when no one was in, or feel like someone in the room with me. But yeah, like I said, I never found him to be scary or make me feel uncomfortable. When I told my mum about it all, she told me to not be silly and stop watching horror films. But I overheard her talking to my stepdad, saying she thought something was in the house. I got talking to someone in the village I lived in, and he said the housing estate was built on what was believed to be a Roman burial ground. It was right on the river, and I know back in the day it was quickest way to get from village to village. Maybe a lot of bodies got dumped there when being carried back to their village, as that used to happen a lot back then. Have you ever heard of the back rooms? The maze of nondescript rooms and hallways that seems to repeat itself over and over again? A place with no windows, no doors, and no obvious way out. A place where you'll always feel like you're being watched. Just some strange story you read online. Nothing to, nothing to worry about. It isn't real. It's real. And I've been there. Or at least to some version of it. I have to be lying, right? 
And after all, I'm just some random person on the internet. You don't know me, and I don't know you. But I'm not lying. I promise you. My name is Cole. I'm 26 years old, and I grew up in a town in upstate New York. My childhood home is old, built around 120 years ago. The land it was built on is even older still. My town sits near what was once a front line for both the French and Indian War, and the American War for Independence. Because of the amount of historical bloodshed that occurred in my area, we obviously have our fair share of not-so-living residents. My town and several of the cities around me are known for ghostly hauntings. The area is practically a swirling pit of paranormal energy. So it comes with no surprise that my home is among the many of experience its share of unexplainable things going on. From toilet lids slamming to doors opening and closing, unexplainable footsteps, and even the occasional appearance of strange shadowy figures moving in the corner of the eye. There was even a point in time where I was too afraid to sleep in our living room, simply because I was paranoid of what might happen. Before I begin to tell my backroom story, I have to give you a basic layout of the house, as it will be important. When you approach our house from the streets, you'll notice that it's basically on top of a small hill. You have to go up two steps just to get into our property. Then, it's another small set of stairs onto our front porch, and another step up into our home. When you enter our front door, you enter into what my family calls our front hallway. Basically, it's a pretty good sized room separated from the rest of the house by a pair of beautiful French doors. To the left is the main staircase to the second floor, and to the right is my dad's office, what used to be the front parlor. For those of you who don't know, there's a reason the living room is, well, called a living room. Basically, funeral parlors didn't become popular until about 1920. So when a person died, their funeral was held at home. And considering how the front parlor in my house is set up, I don't doubt that there was at least one funeral held there. Anyway, after you pass through the French doors, you come into the dining room, living room, separated by a good sized archway, and the short hallway leading to the basement door. The second staircase in the kitchen, with a butler's pantry and a small half bathroom attached. The second staircase is different. Where our main staircase is grand, and obviously meant to impress, this one isn't. It's dark, fully enclosed and hidden away behind a solid wood door. If you walk up the main staircase, you'll enter a moderately sized hallway. To the immediate right, you'll come across the first and arguably largest bedroom. Down the hallway and around a left turn are the other two bedrooms, a large bathroom and the door to the second staircase, and my mother's sewing closet. My nursery and childhood bedroom was directly across from my mother's sewing closet. I used to sleep with my door open and was always terrified of my mother's sewing closet. It's closed off by a set of double doors, but there has always been something dark about it. To me, unless the light was on and my mother was actively working there, it always seemed like there was something lurking inside. Something evil. I had a number of experiences in that room. Most of them are not involving my mother's sewing closet. There are a few experiences, however, that stick out in my memory. They're by far the strangest dreams I've ever had. Alright, I said it. My strangest experience revolve around dreams. Go on, poke some fun. I'll wait. You done? Okay. So, all throughout my childhood, I would have strange experiences around the time I would be falling asleep, or shortly thereafter. There were a few times where I can remember waking up in my mother's sewing closet. In front of me was the narrow opening to a closet. This closet actually does exist, and it really is as creepy as I'm about to describe. It wasn't so much a closet as it was a gap between walls, all exposed rafters, an old dirty linoleum floor, and no light source to speak of. In my dream, I would always walk into the closet. I would walk and walk and walk never reaching the end. I would turn either left or right and climb through a little hole in the wall. What I saw on the other side still weirds me out. I actually try to not think about these dreams as much as possible. Anyway, 
I'd enter into what looked like a near-perfect replica of my own home. Only it was massive, seemed to go on forever, and everything was pure white. What was strange, though, was no matter where I went in that other house, I could never find my own room. It was like it didn't even exist. Where the door would be, there would be nothing. In fact, no matter which hallway I took, I almost always ended up back in the main area of the house. The first few times I had this dream, I felt completely safe. It was just me, this weird as fuck house and a childish need to explore. When the dream was about to end, I would always end up climbing back through the hole, back through the closet, and into my mother's sewing closet. But then it changed. The more I dreamed of that place, the more degraded it became. What had once been a pure white had turned into a dirty, sickly yellow. The place had once been consumed by a soft white light. That glow was long gone. In its place were dingy, flickering lamps that seemed to create more shadows than they did light. I went from loving the thrill of freedom and exploration to becoming almost too scared to move. I would still explore, but I felt like I was being watched. Like I was being hunted, even. Those dreams would end with me running for the hole and escaping my mother's sewing closet as though someone had set my ass on fire. Thankfully, I haven't had a dream like this in years, for which I'm very glad. Every time I think of what I saw, I can't help but shudder. To help set things up, I should tell you that I live in a small town, that it's little more than a suburb for a city, just across the bridge. The city across the bridge is several hundred years old. It was founded in the late 1600s, a little more than an outpost for those who wanted to govern themselves. It was small, little more than a few city blocks. Decades passed with little consequence for the little community. However, that was not to last. In the weeks and months prior to February 8th, 1689, the people of the outpost wrote repeatedly to the regional governor. Their walls had no guards, their garrison was empty, and they didn't have enough cannons. In short, the outpost was defenceless, in the middle of the French and Indian War. Then came that fateful night. On February 8th, the French and their Native American allies came knocking. The raiders came down upon the outpost in the middle of a cold New York winter. They marched past two snowmen the town had erected as their one and only defence. Through the snowed open gates they waltz into the middle of a slumbering town. In a frenzy, the French and their allies razed the town to the ground. Of the town's inhabitants, 60 were killed, including 38 men, 10 women and 12 children. A portion of the Albany militia, along with their Native American allies, pursued the raiders, in the hopes of rescuing the 27 captive villagers, as well as the 50 horses the French had stolen. Sadly, the rescuers were only ever to, able to liberate five men. The rest were taken back towards Montreal, where they are said to have been tortured to death by one of the Native American tribes that allied themselves with the French. Those who survived and escaped capture fared little better. They were forced to trek through the wilderness on a cold February night with nothing more than their nightclothes to keep them warm. Many did not survive the journey. As if this story were not brutal enough, the French are said to have done horrid things to the villagers they terrorised. There's one tale in particular that stands out. It's that of a young mother trying to burn her home with her infant wrapped tightly in her arms. As she made for the door, she found her bath blocked by a young French soldier. Backing away, she found herself cornered against the flames. Is he heavy? The soldier asked the young woman. He held the baby by the feet and swung. The child's head smashed into the doorway, splattering its mother with its brain. Whatever happened to the mother afterwards is unknown. Hundreds of years later, and the remains of the victims are buried in a local cemetery. Original headstones and all. It's called Vale Cemetery if you want to look it up. As sad as their fate was, it seems that even in their eternal rest, they're still tormented. To this day, there are reports of statues bleeding from the head, screaming and crying. I can vouch for strange things happening there. A few years ago, I decided to try some photography techniques. 
my friend and I decided to explore the historical sites of the neighboring city. The first place we went was Vale Cemetery, so I could use some of the statues to practice taking portraits ahead of my participation in a weekly art class that I had started taking that winter. Once I got home that evening, I went to pull all the images I had taken that day onto my computer so I could weed them out and fine tune the ones I decided to keep. I wanted to find that every single one of the several hundred I had taken at Vale Cemetery to either be gone entirely or corrupted beyond use. To this day, the entire district that was built on top of the burned outpost is extremely haunted. It's also said that Vale Cemetery is extremely haunted. With reports of black and white figures walking between the headstones, shadows that sit amongst the branches of the trees, strange singing in the church, and statues that cry and bleed. So here's my story. When I was 14 years old or so, I used to experience some creepy as heck stuff at my sister's two-story house. She never believed me and accused me of making it up to try and scare her family. So I used to sleep all the time, but slowly things started happening. I kept waking up at 2, 3 and 4 a.m. I always had trouble falling asleep. They would all sleep at 9 p.m. I wasn't used to that since my mum would let me sleep whenever I wanted. Well, it started off with me just having sleep problems, but then I started noticing a dark spot in the hallway, darker than everything else around it. And each night I'd stay over, it started to get darker and darker and more detailed until I finally realized it looked like a man standing in the hallway looking into the room I was in, or so I thought. I couldn't make out the face. All I knew was he was wearing a hat and he would just stare into the room, obviously. I'd be freaked out and would force myself to sleep. One time I remember going to the swap meet with my sister's family, when some lady went up to me, grabbed my hand and told me, you see stuff, don't you? I was puzzled and my sister intervened and said, can I help you? She then turned to my sister and told her you're, she sees things that are trying to get her attention. Don't let her interact with them. They're dangerous and they know she can see them. They want to cause harm to her, so be very careful. She turned to me and said, don't talk to them. Don't give them your attention. And she walked away. She was a completely random woman, but I remember the day so clearly. And it was during the time the paranormal stuff was happening at the house. And then everything that was happening became too much. And I didn't want to sleep over, but my nephews insisted I did because they wanted to spend time with me. So I decided on the worst and last night to change rooms. I slept in the next room with my niece who was around eight or something years old. Thinking things would be different, but oh, I was wrong. That night I had no trouble falling asleep, but this time something changed. Instead of me waking up on my own, my niece woke me at 3 a.m. to take her to the bathroom. So I did, we went back to bed. As I was laying there having trouble sleeping, I heard a little girl giggling. I turned to look at my niece and asked, what's so funny? And she was fast asleep at the same moment. A kitchen toy set that no longer worked or had batteries went off. And the toy sound of bubbling hot water went off right after the giggles. I turned to look at the hallway and realized the shadow wearing a hat had been looking into that room the whole time. Not the other one I was in to begin with when I was freaked out. And something started pounding on the wall right next to me. I pulled the covers over my head, panicking, thinking, holy moly, I don't want to get dragged downstairs. Then everything went quiet. And all of a sudden, I hear something whisper my niece's name into my ear. Well, I don't know. This was happening. But after that night, I decided never to sleep over my sister's house ever again. Skip years ahead, and now a few months ago, I'm watching a YouTube video online of urban legends, paying half attention as I'm crafting something when I hear the words, this legend is about the hat man. And it instantly got my full attention. Afterwards, I looked up scary stories about the hat man and everything everyone said was almost exactly how stuff happened to me. I never knew the legend of the hat man, but apparently I experienced it. And hearing now some people had worst experience and even physical ones, I feel very lucky. There were other paranormal things that happened to me in that house and to my nephews. That was probably the worst thing 
that ever happened to me.